further ado, we're going to get right into tonight's topic because it's a very informative topic and we don't want to waste any time. So to get into tonight's topic, Unmasking the Antichrist, we'll start with Revelation. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Let's go to Revelation 14, the last book of the Bible, and we'll start there. And what we're going to do here, you'll, you'll realize that what we're doing is that we're going to basically do some of the verses that we have done before. We're going to go a little fast in the beginning because we've done this before in previous nights. But I want us to recap it so we can set the stage so we know where we're heading. You can see where the Bible, where the Bible is leading us. What page is it in the Bible, by the way? 1465, Revelation 14, we'll start with verse 6. Revelation 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and town and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of our fornication. So we're seeing an angel, there's an angel flying here, and he's saying, fear God and give glory to him. Now verse 9 says, I have this up on the screen, it says, Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, we also said that we talked about what is this last place? We see the wrath. What is the wrath of God? So to know what is the wrath of God, just look over at Revelation 15 verse 1 we'll see what the wrath of God is. And the wrath of God, it says, And I saw another angel, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So we know that the wrath of God is the seven last plagues. Now, question for everyone, does God want us to, uh, does, God want, does God want the wrath of God to come on us? No. No. It is desired that we do not partake of this or this doesn't come on us. This is why he has given us the Bible as a map to guide us so that we can know what is God's will for us. Now we're looking at unmasking the Antichrist. So we're going to look at every single verse in the Bible where the Antichrist is mentioned. And we have looked at this before. Jump over to 1 John. We'll look at these quickly. As I mentioned, this is just recap. But we want to set the foundation for where we're heading. 1 John 2, 18 and 19. 1 John 2, 18 and 19. We're looking for the word Antichrist. Antichrist in all the verses in the Bible. 1 John 2, 18 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now as they may, as there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that, that they might be made manifest that are not all of us. That's the first verse. We see Antichrist there. Now let's look at 1 John 2.22. Let's drop down a bit. It says, Who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist, who is a liar, the one that denied Jesus. He is Antichrist, that denied the Father and the Son. Now let's look at 1 John, jump over to verse 4, 3 and 4. 1 John 4, 3 and 4. And remember, this is just recap. Verse 3 and 4 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God, and that is that spirit of Antichrist. Wherefore, ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So we see that the Antichrist has already come, even in John's time. It's there. It's already there. Verse 4 said, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he 
that is in you that he that is in the world. So can we overcome the Antichrist? Can we be stronger than the Antichrist? Or can we be with God to not be in the Antichrist system? All right? Now, let's look at 2 John. Just turn over one more page. 2 John 1, 7. 2 John 1, 7 says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and a what? Antichrist, right? So we see all the verses where Antichrist is identified. Now, something we note from those verses, if you look on the screen, we picked out some key points from the verses we just read. There are many Antichrists. They come from inside the Christian church. They may profess the faith in Christ, but actually deny him. We picked those out. Now, there's also some more points that we made. One of the goal is to deceive. These many antichrists are here now. So they're here now. There is also a spirit of antichrist. Now, remember we said that to know about the antichrist, you want to unlock the password. And Thessalonians and John have the passwords. So let's jump over to Thessalonians real quick. Second Thessalonians. Remember Thessalonians, you can find that in all the books with T. We'll jump to 2 Thessalonians. And as I mentioned, this is just recap. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And this is what it says. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we see the son of perdition. Who is this son of perdition? Or what does son of perdition mean? To know what the son of perdition mean, we'll jump over to John 17, 12. Let's jump over to John 17, 12. And if I'm going fast, this is just recap. This is recap. So John 17, 12. We're setting the foundation to find out who the Antichrist is. John 17, 12. And this is what it says. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that, give, those that thou givest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And let me give you some context here, what's going on here. So Jesus is talking to the Father, and Jesus is saying, that all of the, all the disciples I've had, I could have kept. I was able to kept, keep. But one of them I lost. Who was the one that was lost? Judas. Judas was lost. So Judas is called the son of perdition. Now, what it's also saying is that the Antichrist would be just like Judas. You would not be able to identify the Antichrist because he would look so much like God. He would be with God. He would dwell with God. He would mingle and do miracles and teach the gospel just as the other disciples did. So you will not be able to recognize the Antichrist unless God shows you and you study for yourself. All right. Now, look at this one. If we understand the hint, Paul is plainly telling us that Judas was a type of Antichrist. Antichrist is to wear a mask. He is to enter the church as Judas entered the garden professedly to kiss his master, but in reality to betray him. Wasn't that what Judas did? He pretended to love Jesus all these years, and then he betrayed him in the end. That's the Antichrist, his post in histories, page 10 and 11. Now, in Revelation, we studied Revelation a couple nights back, we looked at two beasts. Jump over with me to Revelation 13. I think I have the verses on the screen. Now, this beast we saw here, this beast, we discovered that he's not in the Bronx Zoo. He's not at Claws and Paws. So this is not a real beast. This is a symbol. This beast symbolizes a symbol. We can pick up this beast in Revelation 13. Now, I have them on the screen. If you, uh, if you can look at it in your Bible as well, but I have some of the verses on the screen. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. 
Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So we see we have leopard, bear, and lion. Where did we heard those before? Did we see that before? We saw that in what? Daniel, right? Now, look at the order of the beast here. Notice the order. Now, the first one was leopard, bear, and then lion. When we looked at the beast in Daniel, we saw it was lion, bear, and leopard. Now, this is John. Remember, John is writing Revelation. Daniel wrote the book of Daniel. So what is the difference? Why do we see this difference? Now, Daniel is in the Old Testament. Daniel is actually looking forward. So Daniel is seeing the, the kingdoms. Remember, a beast represents a kingdom. Daniel is seeing the kingdoms as they will come. Now, John, Old, New Testament, John is looking back. Remember all this past already. So John is looking at this in reverse. So John is seeing the reverse to what Daniel saw. It also says, and I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled after the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him. Now, we also looked at another beast in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, we looked at another beast, and we were able to identify that beast as the United States of America. Who remembers that? Okay, good. And that's Revelation 13, 11, down to Revelation 17. That was a beast from the earth. So we'll see something here, what's going on with these two beasts a little bit later. Now, Revelation 14, 12 says... Here is the patience of the saints. Here are, they who, here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So something to note as we're going through this study, the whole thing about antichrist and beasts and, and all of this stuff that we're discussing, it comes down to one thing. One thing it comes down to. It comes down to worship. Who will you worship in the end? That's what it comes down to. Now, another quick question. What is the highest form of worship? What is the highest form of worship? Or what is the highest element to worship? The sister mentioned it earlier. You mentioned it earlier. What you had said earlier, say it again. Obedience. obedience. So the highest form of worship or the highest element to worship is obedience. Obedience to God. Obedience to who you're loyal to. This is why in Revelation 14 we see it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of Daniel, we just looked at that. We saw, we're going to look at some pieces there in Daniel. Let's jump over to Daniel, because we just talked about Daniel. Let's jump over to Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 7. Let's jump over to Daniel chapter 7, and we'll see what's happening there. Before I get to that, let's go to Daniel 7. I'll read from verse, let me read from verse 2. And it says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my night vision, what, what page is it? What page is it? 1055. Now, if I'm going fast, because this is review, this is stuff that we've been studying, but I have to set these points so I can identify who the Antichrist is, all right? Okay. Daniel 7.2 says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my, night, in my vision by night, and behold, a four, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, what did we say winds were? War. Wars and strife. Good. Good students. Now, so what Daniel is seeing, Daniel is seeing that on a time of war, in a, type of, in a time of strife between the people, four creatures are coming up. Let's see the uh, characteristics of the creatures now. Daniel 7, 3 says, and, the four, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld things till the wings therefore was plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand up upon the feet, 
as a man, and a man heart was given to it. That's the first beast. The first beast we're seeing here is a lion with wings. Now let's look at the second one. The second one says, And behold, another beast, a second like a be to a beer, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth, of it between the teeth of it. And there said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour, and devour much flesh. So, let me just give you some characteristics here. A beast represents a kingdom. That's Daniel 7.23. A beast is a kingdom. C, we saw the beast coming up out of the sea. What did we say C was? People. People. Winds and strife is? War. War, right? Now, the first beast is Babylon. We identify that from Scripture. That's 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. The next beast that came on the scene was Medo-Persia. That's the bear we just read about. Let's look at the other beast. And after this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. We know that that was Greece. It's like a leopard. It has four heads and the wings. And then, but then there was another one. Let's look at that one. That was Rome. It says, Then I saw in a night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. We talked about that. That's Rome. Let's look at the other verse after that. So this beast comes up. It had ten horns. Great iron teeth. Let's look at verse 8. This is Daniel. He said, I considered the horns, and behold, there come up among them a little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in the horns were eyes like of a man, and it spoke and speaking great things. So we see that this beast comes up, and after it comes up, it had ten horns on his head, and then ten horns, from the, between the ten horns, a small horn come up. That small horn comes up and plucks up three other horns, but this horn is different. This horn is little, plucks up three, it has eyes like a man, and it has a mouth, and the mouth speak great things. So we're going to look at some characteristics. In Daniel 7, 8, it said the horn is what? Little. Little. Now, a next characteristic, it comes up in Western Europe. It comes up among these other horns in Western Europe. Daniel 7.24, it came up, remember I said that AD 476 was when Rome lost its reign and power, right? Now, let's look at Daniel 7.24. Daniel 7.24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall what? Subdue three. What does subdue three mean? He will destroy three. So we're seeing that he comes up, plucks up these three, but he just don't only pluck them up, he destroys them, he annihilates them. So we see in Daniel 7.24, this happened in AD 476. Let's look at another characteristics about this little horn. We talked about it plucked up tree. Let's look at another one. And it has the eyes of a man. Daniel 7, 8, we just read that. He has eyes of a man. Daniel 7, 25. Let's look at Daniel 7, 8, 25. We're looking for all the characteristics of this little horn. It said, and he spake great words against the Most High. Who's the Most High? God, right? and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hands until a time and a times and a dividing of a time. So we see some more characteristics here about this little horn. Now, he says, great, he speaks great words and blasphemy. We looked at what's blasphemy the other night, but let's recap what is that. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Now, if Jesus said, I and my Father are one, what, is this, what does that make Jesus? Is Jesus God? Yes, he is God. 
But the Jews, they looked at Jesus and they got upset when he said that because they're like, no, they didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, so they didn't agree with what he's saying, but we know that Jesus is God. Look at what they said. We want to know what is blasphemy. Then the Jews took up stones against, again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him and said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself a god. Can a man make himself a god? What is it if a man makes himself a god? Blasphemy, right? Let's look at some other characteristics. Luke 20, 21. When the four friends lowered their friend down to the roof, while Jesus was in the house, and Jesus healed the guy, Jesus forgave him of his sins. Look at what the religious leader said to him. When, they, when he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Now look at what the leader says. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaketh what? Blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but who? So, who can forgive sins? Only who? Only God can forgive sins. So if a man claims to forgive sins, what is that? Blasphemy, right? Good students. Now, so we see that he will speak great words in blasphemy. He will also persecute. Let's look at Daniel 7.25 again, and we'll look at that. It says, Daniel 7.25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. Wearing out the saints is persecuting. Look at Daniel 7.21. It says, I beheld and the same horn, this, we're talking about a little horn here. Look, if you look at Daniel 7.21, the same little horn, I beheld and the same horn made what? War with who? Saints. Made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So was he successful in making war with the saints? Yes, and he prevailed. So we see the little horn, he speaks grace word of blasphemy, and he persecutes. Let's see what else we have. He would also think to change time and laws. Can God's laws change? Can any man change God's laws? Okay. Now do you see how all the nights are adding up? Remember we went through all these through the previous nights. Now you're seeing all, how all the nights are adding up, right? Let's look at Daniel 7.25 again. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and what? And think to change times and laws. He will think to do it. He will think to do it. But will he be able to succeed? No. Because God will have a people who will stand for what's truth. Okay? So he will think to change times and laws. Now, Daniel 7.25 talks about he will reign for a time, times, and a half a time. Now, we want to know what is a time, times, and half a time? Say, Sister Peggy. Uh huh. Two is times. Right. And a half time is a half. Mm hmm. Good. Sister Peggy is catching it. Good, good. So a time is a year, times is two years, and half a time is half a year. Jump over with me in Revelation 12 14. We just don't make stuff up here, we want you to see it from the Bible. That's remember I told you that when you come the first night and the other nights? We're showing you from the Bible. We're not making anything up. And as I mentioned, if I'm going fast, this is just review. Revelation 12, 14. Revelation 12, 14 says this. And to the woman, this was a woman. She, was, she fled into the wilderness. And to the woman were given two wings of, of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a holding place where she nourishes for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. But that gives us the same time, time, and a half a time. So we want to know what exactly is this time, time, half of a time. So let's go back over to Revelation. Turn the page over to Revelation 12, 6. Revelation 12, 6 says, And the woman, this is the same woman, 
And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that she should feed, that he should feed her. Sorry, let me read it again. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So a time times and half a time is twelve hundred and sixty days. Now, 1260 days in prophecy, what does a day represent in prophecy? A year. So for 1260 years. Now, a time is one year. How, biblically, Bible scholars and in Bible time, a day only consists of 360 days, not 365. 360. So if it's a time, it's 360. If it's a times, which is two years, how much is that? 2 times 360, 720, 720, and half a time, half of 360, 180. So if you add a 360, 720, and 180, you'll get 1260 days. Now also we read about 42 months. It's the same as 42 months. So this horn would be a little horn coming up in Western New York. It'll be a mound of 10 horns. It will come up after them. It would pluck up three of them. It has the eyes of a man. It speaks great words of blasphemy. It persecutes the saints. It thinks to change times and laws. And it reigns for 1260 years. By the show of hands, who think they have figured out who the Antichrist is? By the show of hands. Pretty good amount of hands. I want to tell you something. This is nothing new. This is nothing new that I'm telling you. It is nothing new. Perhaps you might say, I knew that. Or I've heard this before. But you didn't have the full evidence to, to put the pieces together. So this is nothing new. Okay? Now let's see. Now, I'm going to say something here. Let me have a drink of water first. Before I go on, I see Mike smiling there. <clears throat> now, God is not against sincere people. Why did God give us his word? He gave us his word because he wants us to know what? Good and evil. And also to know him. And also to know what? The truth. Now, the Bible is not to embarrass anyone. God did not give us the Bible to embarrass anyone. God loves us. The foundation of God is love. He loves us. God loves sincere people, but what God dislikes is error. He doesn't like error. So God gives us his word so that we can study his word to identify error so that we can follow after Christ. Because at the end of the day, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that it was Jesus Christ who hung on the cross for your sins, for my sins. And I want you to take it personally. Think about it. Jesus was the one who came and paid the price for you and for me. He was the one. Last night we looked at who created everything. Who created all things? Jesus. We identify that he created all things. He created us. We didn't evolve. He took time and form us. And then in our fallen nature, he came and he died just for us. So God's word is not to put anybody down. It's not to attack anyone. But his word is to lift us up. We just have to embrace it and allow him to lead us. That's all he wants. He wants us to surrender ourselves to him. Now, I'm going to move on. So before I get into that, I want to say something else. When you hear the word anti, anti means what? Against. Against. But there's two other meanings to the word anti. There's a primary meaning and there's a secondary meaning. Let's look at those two meanings. The primary meaning is a primary particle opposite that is instead of because. That's the primary one. But there's a secondary meaning. 
a secondary root of the word. And this is what it means. Often used in the composition to denote contrast, requitual, substitution, correspondence, and etc. Substitution. So what we're seeing here is that the Antichrist is not necessarily going to just say, I'm the Antichrist. But what he will do, or what they will do, is substitute themselves in the place of God. Now, with that being said, how many people think they've figured out who the Antichrist is? Okay, more hands are going up. So, I'm going to tell you who the Antichrist is. One more time. Everybody, I see everybody's in suspense at the edge of their seat. Let's identify these characteristics. It's a little horn he, over in Western Europe. He comes up among the ten horns. He comes up after the ten horns. He plucks up three. He has eyes of a man, speaks great words of blasphemy. He persecutes, think to change, times and laws, reigns for 1260 years. Who, what is the Antichrist? Close. You're right. The Antichrist is the Vatican and the papacy. Now, as I mentioned, this is nothing new. Anyone ever heard of John Knox? Before I say that, this is not an attack on Catholics. Don't take it that way. I'm not attacking anyone. This is not an attack on Catholic. It's not an attack on anyone. It's just the word. But this is not nothing new. Anyone ever heard of John Knox? John Knox was one who believed in this. You had John Calvin who believed in this. You had Roger Williams who believed in this. You had John Wesley who believed in this. It is not a single person. It is a system. Not a person, but a system. Now, anyone know of this guy, Martin Luther? Who knows of Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a Catholic monk. And Martin Luther, when he started studying the Bible for himself, he realized that the thing that the church was doing was wrong, contrary to the doctrines. Martin Luther decided that he's going to write 95 theses. Yesterday, October 31st, was the Reformation Day. Martin Luther wrote these 95 theses, questioning the teachings of the Catholic Church. He nailed it to the door in, in Wittenberg, Germany, and he said, I need answers. I want you to show me from the Bible why we're doing this. They were selling indulgences, and Martin Luther, while he was on the step, he bought an indulgence, and he was on his knees, kneeling, climbing to the top, and he realized that this is not what God is. This is not the correct of God. So Martin Luther decided that he's going to ask questions. He needs answers. And they told him that you need to recant, because they realized that what Martin Luther was saying is biblically the sound that their teaching was not scriptural and fully biblical doctrine. They said, you need to recant. Martin Luther said, I will not recant. And they said, we'll take care of you. But Martin Luther stood firm for what he believed. Look at what Martin Luther said. And Martin Luther was a Catholic pope who later started the Protestant Reformation and the Protestant Church. And look at what he said. Martin Luther said, unless I'm convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and council, for they have contradicted each other my conscience is captive to the word of what? God. I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against God, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Martin Luther had the conviction. And Martin Luther wanted the truth. And he said, if you can't tell me, I'm not recanting. Now, let's look at some other guys. Wendell. Wycliffe, Tyndale, Luther, Calvin, Kramer in the 17th century, Bunyan. Who know, ever heard the book Pilgrim's Progress? Pilgrim's Progress? That was written by a man, Charles Bunyan. Charles Bunyan, he believed this too as well. Now, one thing I want to say as well, if you go to in the 1600s, 15, in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, if you went to any Baptist, Methodist, Prosper, uh, Pentecostal church, um, they would tell you, they would identify who the Antichrist is. So we had Bunyan, the translator of the King James Bible, and the man who published the West, Westminster and Baptist Conference Confession of Faith. 
Now, Sir Isaac Newton, who ever heard of Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton believed this as well. John Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently, Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Rye, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, they know and they could have identified that the beast in Revelation 13 is the Antichrist, and the Antichrist system refers to the papacy. Now, look at this as well. All roads, all roads lead to Rome, uh, page 205, 206. All saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. The reformers and their hearers were great scholars and knew the word of God and the Holy Spirit as living teachers. This is John Wesley. He said, oh reader, this is a subject where, wherein we also are deeply concerned and which we must, we must be treated, not as a point of curiosity, but as a solemn warning from God. The danger is near. Be armed both against the forces and fraud, even with the whole armor of God out of the sea. What came up out of the sea? The beast, right? Now, that is Europe. That, is, that beast is the Roman papacy, and it came to a point 600 years since standing now, and will for some time longer. To this, and to no other power on earth, agrees the whole text, and every part of it, and every part of it in every point, this beast is a spiritually secular power, opposite to the kingdom of Christ, a power not merely spiritual or ecclesiastical, not merely secular, secular or political, but a mix of both. If you look at the papacy, it's a combination of both church and state. The other night we talk about any time church and state come together to mix, the next thing that happens is persecution. So if you look at the papacy, it's both church and state combined together. Now, remember we said to make war with the saints. It made war with the saints, with the Waldensians and the Albigenses against these many of the popes made open war. Until now, the blood of Christians had been shed only by heathen or errands. You know, if you look at history, history is recorded that they have killed 50 million to 200 people. They deny that it was 200. The Protestants say it's 200, but they say 50 million. So we're seeing that they did make war with the saints. From this time, by sacred, any but the papacy and another, this seemed to mean the Roman, the Roman Antichrist. So this is John Wesley commentary on the Bible, chapter 13. Now we looked at these features, and we can identify all these features, and all these features, and among the many other points and scriptures that we read, identified this nation as the Antichrist. Now as I mentioned, there's a lot of sincere uh, Catholic brothers and sisters that we have friends. We're not saying it's against people, it's a system. How many of you out there have Catholic friends, by the show of hands? There you go, there you go. And tonight you may have heard something you've never heard before. I'm just the messenger, okay? But we all have friends. This is not something specifically to the people. It's about the system. But what God wants you to do, he wants you to realize the system. He wants you to realize the system and study for yourself, okay? Now, let's look at Pope, let's look at some of what the Pope said. Pope Leo the 13th, he said, the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Who is the supreme teacher? God, Jesus. The supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of mind therefore requires together with a perfect accord in, in the one faith. Complete submission and obedience of the will to the, to the church and to the Roman pontiff as to who? God himself. So what is he doing there? He's blaspheming. He's making himself a God because he's saying, you have to be completely obedient to me as to God. Who created us? God created us, right? Now let's look at some more. We hold upon this earth the place of who? God Almighty. Who, who, seriously, who created us? Who created the world? But if you're going to tell me we hold... The place on earth is God Almighty. So a man making himself God, what do we call that? 
blasphemy, right? Let's look at another one. The Pope is considered, and this is from the, their writings. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God and of the Trinity. Who is the second person in the Trinity? Jesus Christ. So he's basically saying, we, the Pope, we take the place of Jesus Christ. So if you take the place, where is Jesus? It says, we take the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. This is crossing the threshold of hope, His Holiness John Paul II. And being undermined by the sometimes widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God, even in habitual ways, without approaching the sacraments of reconciliation. That is Pope John Paul II. Reconciliation and Penitence, December 2nd, 1984. So we looked at this little horn and we identified all these characteristics with this nation. Now, remember I said the persecution that they carried out was so severe. They were persecuting left and right back in the days. They persecuted about 50 to 200 million people because people did not want to subdue themselves to their teachings. Now remember I said there were three nations. The three nations where the horn came up and plucked up those three nations. Why did you think it plucked up the Vandali, the Heruli, and the Saxo Saxons? Sax Vandals, Heruli, and the Albigenses. Why do you think it plucked up those three nations? Those three nations, they said, we want no allegiance to the Pope. We want to stand on our own. So the Pope, we know what he did? He sent in his armies and annihilated those three nations. He made an example of them destroying those three nations. Now this guy, Nicholas Riley and Hugh Littenmore, they were burned at the stake. They were literally burned at the stake for standing up for biblical truth. Now, so we looked at the features again, I put it again. Now, question, which day is the Sabbath day? I want you to pay attention to this. Which day is the Sabbath day? And this you can find in any Catholic, uh, it's called the, I forgot the book, you, before you become a Catholic, Say it again? Catechism. Yes, the catechism. You read this before you actually become a Catholic or you join the church. Which day is the Sabbath day? This is what they say. They're not denying it. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday? Is a cat the, the converse catechism, sorry. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So you're transferring the blessing. Can anyone transfer the blessing that God has in a day to another day? No. God has set a day. You can, man can't transfer anything. God has put that in place. Look at this one. The church, after changing the day of rest the Jew, from the Jewish Sabbath to, of the seventh day to the first day of the week, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to keep holy, as the Lord's day. So what they did, they took out the fourth commandment, no, they took out the second commandment, they moved up the third commandment, and they shortened the third commandment and says, just remember to keep the day holy. And they took out the second commandment, the second commandment that says, you shall not have no other gods before me, no idols. They took that one out completely. So what are they doing there? They're changing God's what? Law. Laws. Remember the verse that they will think to change what? times and laws. So they took out the second commandment, moved up the third commandment, and then they just called it the Lord's day. Now question, what is the second commandment? The second commandment is, thou shall not take the, Lord, take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's the Catholic Convert, Convert Catechism, page 49. So we looked at all this. Now to identify the 1260 years, in 538 AD, that's when Rome came onto the set, and they reigned from 538 to 1798. That is 1260 years. At the end of 1260 years, Napoleon's general, born apart, succeeded in putting the deadly wound into this nation. Remember he said you saw he came up and he had a wound that was healed? That deadly wound was when Napoleon born apart came in and cooked took the, the Pope captive. They took him captive. My friends, this is all in the history books. 
Like I'm saying, this is nothing new. I'm not the first one that's telling you this. Or I mean, maybe I might be the first one, but I'm not the first one to come up with this stuff. This stuff is all over the internet. This is not nothing new. Now, remember we talked about two beasts in Revelation 13. We talked about a little lamb, and then we talked about the first beast. And we saw that the second beast will give power to the first beast. Right? Let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. I want you to see this. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 11. We identified in Revelation 13 that the second beast, the lamb-like beast, was the United States of America. The first beast in Revelation 13 is the papacy. Now look at this one. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the herd, and having two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all power of the what? First beast before him, and he caused the earth, and them which dwell therein to what? Worship the what? First beast. So have we been seeing lately a union between the papacy and the United States of America? Have we been seeing that? Do you know when um, President Obama, I think, was in office, and Pope Francis, Pope Francis came and speak in front of the House of Representatives. That was the first time a pope ever stood where the President of the United States st should be standing to speak to the whole entire House of Representatives. So we're seeing how these two pieces are beginning to work together. Now, 666, I have to touch on this, because a lot of people will say the beast is 666. Now, don't worry about that. Nobody's going to be walking around with any number on their head, 666. I'll show you what 666 is tonight, because many people believe that in the end, people will have 666 on their forehead or a barcode or something like that. What is 666? So 666, so we already know that the papacy is the Antichrist. So if the papacy is the Antichrist, it must be associated with 666. Let's find out where that is. So everyone wants to know what 666 is, right? Okay. Now, Revelation 13, it says, 13, 18, here is the wisdom. Let him who hears understand, calculate the number of the what? Beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So no one is going to be walking around with 666 on their forehead. It's the number of a man, and we can calculate that number. And it's the number of a beast. So let's see how we can do that. Now, this is uh, our Sunday Visitors, April 18, 1915. The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these. So the Pope wears a crown. He wears a crown, and it has an inscription on it. And this is not pertaining to one particular Pope. Throughout all the different Popes, they wear a crown. There's an inscription on that crown. The inscription is Vicarious Philae Dei, which is in Latin. Look at what it means in Latin. For vicar of son of God. You know what vicar means? Anyone knows what vicar means? Substitute or replacement. So that crown that he wears on his head, when he puts that crown on, it means that he is replacing God or he's a substitute for God. As long as he holds that position, he is in the position of God on earth. Now, remember we said it's a number of a man. Not, uh, it's not a number that's going to be in everyone. It's a number of a man. So it's vicarious philae dei. So let's do some math. Roman numerals. So vicarious, the V is what in Roman numbers? Five. I is one. C is 100. A is nothing. R is nothing. I is one. U is five. That's 112. Philae. It's F is nothing, I is 1, L is 50, I is 1, I is 1. That's 53. Dei. D, D, I. D is 500, E is none, 1 is, I is 1. That comes up to 112 plus 53 plus 501 is 666. Six, six. The number on the crown that the Pope wears is 666. Six, six. It identifies his position of the mark of the beast on earth. Now, there have been some good popes and there have been some bad popes. 
But like I said, this is not an attack on Catholics. It's not an attack on the church. It's just an attack on the system. I shouldn't even say an attack. It's a calling out to identify the system, a system where these people are placing themselves in the place of God, claiming to forgive sins and claiming to be God on earth. Now, so in Revelation, what does God say in Revelation? God tells us specifically in Revelation 14, 12, he says, Here is the patience of the saints. They are there who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I want to tell you something here about this as we get ready to wind down to the end. Who knows the story when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you remember when all... And let me just, let me just give you a little visual here of what happened. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he finally decided he's going to pray, and he was praying. What did he say? He said, Lord, if it, die, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But then he said something. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, if we're going to love God, it's not our will. It's God's will. What does God want for us? Jesus, in saying, let thy will be done, chose to take on all of our sins, every single one of us here, including myself. I'm no better than anyone. All of our sins. And he took them to the cross. And he went through the most gruesome death you can think about on the cross. The things that we did to Jesus, we can talk about that another time. But he endured all of that on the cross just for each and every one of us to have eternal life. And all Jesus is asking is if we love him, if we love him because he first loved us so much that before the foundations of the world was created, he knew that he was going to go through this, and he decided to still go through it. You know why? Because he wants to be with us, and he wants us to be with him for all of eternity. And all Jesus is asking for us is in return, is that we exchange that love to God, to realize that he's our creator, and he wants us to be obedient to him, and to abide in him daily, fully and truly. Now he says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All Jesus wants us to do is to be obedient to him and have faith in him. When he said, not my will, but thy will, that is the faith of Jesus. Jesus wants us to exercise that same faith, to surrender it all for him, because he has done the same for us. And as I'm going to mention, Again, this is not an attack on any church. It's not an attack on everyone. God loves us all. But God has given his word so that we can identify truth and we can identify error. Because at the end of the day, the truth will set us free. And who the son, who the son, who is the son? Jesus. Who the son has set free is what? Free indeed. If it's your desire to be free indeed tonight, just raise your hands with me and say, I want to be free. That's all God is asking for, to be free. Now also I'm going to mention, I've given you a lot of information tonight. I'm going to give the handouts. And as I say every night, I want you to take the handout and I want you to study for yourself. I want you to do your research for yourself and see what you come up with. Because this, the Bible, is not a secret book. If we truly pray and ask God for the Holy Spirit, and the Bible said to study, to show yourself approved unto God, God will show you the word. He will reveal the truth to you. All right? So let's have a word of prayer as we close tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the word. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your sacrifice. And we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit that you've given to us. If we ask, 
and he will come and lead us into all truth. Dear Lord, I know that for some, the topic we discussed tonight might be new or it might be heavy, but I pray that you soften their hearts and lead them and guide them, O oh Lord. We're here because we're all studying to thirst after the truth and to walk in your righteousness and to acknowledge you as our creator. Be with us as we part ways tonight. Protect us and watch over us and keep us. Bring us back tomorrow night safely. And dear Lord, I pray that you bless each family here. Bless each home. Continue to watch over them. Send your heavenly angels to dwell in their home and to abide with them and to lead them. And to know that for all of us, you've loved us. You have a love for us, an everlasting love that we can't comprehend. And that love that you have for us, it, you, you've paid the price because you want us to be with you. Keep us now, we pray, and take us home safely. We thank you, Lord, for all you're doing in each and every one of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.